know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, of course, this is David speaking as he was facing the great giant Goliath. There's a battle going on between the Philistines on one side and the Israelites on the other. And this is symbolic of the battle that every young person must face here tonight, young and old. Because the Bible says in Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Inside of us we have two natures, a fleshly nature, a carnal nature, and a spiritual nature. And they're constantly at war inside of the believers especially. Now here is a battle going on. Here's the Valley of Elah. And on one side of the Israelites, the other side of the Philistines, and this great giant of a man is challenging the Israelites to a duel. You see, the Philistines picked out their strongest man. The Israelites were to pick out their strongest man. And whoever won, won the battle, won the war. Now that would just mean one person for each side. Now the Bible tells us how big Goliath was. He was nine feet, nine inches. He was clothed in heavy armor. He had a spear heavier than a weaver's beam, almost as big as a tree. He defied the armies of Israel for 40 days. Nobody had the courage to go out and fight Goliath. The men of Israel were afraid. They were trembling as they stood on their side of the valley. Now there's a small young man when I say young man, he was probably 15 or 16 years of age. And he had been watching his father's sheep while his brothers were out with the armies. And so his father said to him one day, David, I want you to go visit your brothers and see how they're doing in the battle. And take these 10 loaves and 10 cheeses to them. And so David approaches the camp where they're camped. And he hears the challenge of Goliath, the giant who says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And David begins to ask questions. What in the world's going on? He said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, you know, the world today faces some giants. We face giants of social injustice. We face the giants of wars that are being fought at this moment. We face the giants of AIDS that is about to wipe out one middle African country and is sweeping many parts of the world and no cure in sight. We face the giants of energy crisis, an ozone crisis, the greenhouse crisis, poverty, starvation in Africa that we read about. All of these things are giants that the world faces right now. And we need God's help. We cannot solve these problems ourselves. And then there are individual giants that you face in your life. Young people today face giants. They have to battle with these giants every day. One of them is a desire for acceptance or peer pressure. The identity crisis. Status to be recognized. And all young people have this problem, especially in school. The peer pressure on you is so great to take that smoke or to take that crack. Just one dose of crack and you're hooked for life. And there seems to be no cure to it. It's sweeping the country. And the drug problem is just like an invasion of an enemy army, except it's far worse. And we're at war, whether we like it or not, with drugs. And then young people have a longing for security. That's another giant that you face. While young people may be rebelling, they actually are wanting authority in their lives. You see, we were built for authority. Some philosophy will ultimately master you. Some ideology is going to direct your life. You're going to give yourself to someone or something to believe in. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He said again in John 13, 13, you call me master and Lord for so I am. In Christ, there can be the authority that you've been searching for. Whether you like it or not, you really want authority. And that's one of the reasons many young people 
rebel. I can understand why they rebel against some of the parents that I see interviewed on television. Because they're not worthy to be parents. But there's also among young people a hunger to be loved. An American juvenile judge said some time ago, I've never had a wayward girl before me who was loved by her father. Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister and had almost as much to do with Hitler's rise to power as anyone else. He was a PhD from Heidelberg University, a very intellectual man, as were many of the Nazis. And yet he had polio and he limped as he walked and young people in the school would make fun of him. They called him the limping louse and people didn't love him. They weren't attracted to him until one day this little man from Austria came along and put his arm around him and loved him and gave him a place and made him feel accepted and wanted. And he gave his life to Nazism. God does that for you. He comes and puts his arms around you and loves you. And he says, you can find a place with me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I will love him, the scripture says. And he proved his love by giving his son to die for us on the cross. The apostle John said, behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us. And the thing that I said yesterday, I'd like to repeat tonight. If you get nothing out of these meetings, out of this mission, I hope that you will remember that God loves you. He's interested in you. He has every hair of your head numbered. You are an individual before God whom he loves. And if you had been the only person in the whole world, his son would have died on the cross for you. Yes, he can be the authority. He can be the love. And then another giant that young people face is the problem of sex. A 24-year-old woman, a nice girl, a quiet social work student, who wanted little more from life than to fall in love and someday have a family of her own. When she got involved with an older man in what she says was her first sexual relationship, the prospect of AIDS never even occurred to her. The relationship has been over now for two years, but she has been diagnosed as having AIDS-related complex. In the beginning, she says, I thought a lot about suicide. I thought, here I am. I just finished college. I'm ready to begin my life, and it's already all over. You see, sex is not a sin. Certain types of lust are a sin. There are certain types of lust that are not sin, because lust means desire. Desire to do the best you can is not sin, but when you desire something that is wrong, you see, man has taken something good and holy and corrupted it, and God's great gift has been perverted. And why does God say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Why does he say that? Does he not want us to have a good time? He does it to protect marriage. He does it to protect your body. He does it to protect you psychologically. Because you see, psychologically, you have that sense of guilt and emotional disturbances and insecurity and you feel unloved. How can you face the giant of sex? Young people today, young men, they reach their peak at about 18 to 22 in their sexual desire. Women a little bit later, but all have it. It's a gift from God, but we've perverted it and we've misused it. And now we're beginning to pay for it in these terrible diseases and other things that are sweeping many parts of the world. How can you face this giant, this urge, this passion that you have and still be true to God and still be clean and pure? There's no way, not in the modern day, except you have Christ in your heart who will give you supernatural power to resist and to say no and to be pure and to practice chastity. The marks of a Christian are self-control and self-discipline. 
Paul wrote to Timothy and said, keep yourself pure. He said, flee youthful lust. He also said concerning himself, he said, I keep my own body under obedience and discipline and bring it into subjection. You can do that too with Christ's help. If he's your master and your Lord, you can control this powerful energy that you have and that God has given for a purpose. We wouldn't have the propagation of the race. Somebody asked me, why did God give us sex? I said, I wouldn't be here were it not for sex, and neither would you. It's a gift from God, for, but inside of marriage, inside certain perimeters. And we're to keep those perimeters. And there's no joy, and there's no thrill, and there's no love, and there's no excitement, and there's no passion comparable to sex within marriage. Sex within marriage between two believers is a marvelous thing. Yes, there are spiritual forces of evil in the world. There are spiritual forces of good in the world. And on one side is God. On the other side is the tempter, the devil, Satan. And there's a great battle going on in our world, and that battle is going on inside you too. And there's only one way to withstand the giants and to conquer the foe. Now notice that David was out experienced. He'd never been in a battle. He was outnumbered because the giant Goliath had an armor bearer. He was outarmed. David had nothing but his slingshot. He was outweighed. And David said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God and the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David had nothing but his faith in God. And you and I must go out with our faith in God, daily Bible reading and prayer to meet the enemy that we must meet every day and every hour of every day. There's no let up. Satan never lets up. David went out clothed in the arm of God, depending on God and trusting in God. And David gets his sling and he stoops and he chooses in the, in the little brook that was between the two armies, he chooses five round stones. Somebody says, why did he choose five? He only needed one. Well, there's a passage in 2 Samuel 21, 22 that says he had, that Goliath had four sons. And whether he was his sons or his brothers, David expected that as soon as he got through with Goliath, he'd have four of his family to deal with. And they might be giants too. And he was going to get ready for all of them. Now, five stones that you as young people ought to take with you. You take a personal faith in Christ. Notice personal. David had a personal relationship with God. And then a daily devotional life. And then a disciplined life. And a dedication to the service of other people. And preparedness. David had those, you can have those five stones in your little bag. A personal faith in Christ. A daily devotional life a disciplined life, a dedication to the service of other people, and your preparedness, and you're ready to do battle with the enemy every day. Lincoln once said, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. You get prepared and someday your chance will come. And so the giant Goliath laughs and sneers and taunts David. And David said to him, this day will the Lord deliver you into my hand. And so David took his sling and he threw the stone and it went right into the forehead of Goliath. And to the amazement of everyone, both Philistines and Israelites, he fell down dead. David didn't have a sword. So he reached over and he took Goliath's great big sword and he severed his head and took that head in his hand and carried it back to the armies of Israel. And the armies of Israel began to pursue the Philistines as the Philistines fled and they won the battle that day because one young boy had faith enough to believe in God that God could do anything. And this young man had prepared in his youth. He'd made his decision as a boy to serve God at any cost. He made his decision to meditate on God night and day. He made his decision to live for God, to live a life of purity before God. 
in the strength of God. He knew he didn't have the strength. But with yielding to God, God would give him the strength. And in the same way, you cannot face the giants alone. You need Christ. And you can receive Christ into your heart tonight, or you can rededicate your life to him tonight. I'm going to ask you to do that. We saw yesterday over 1,500 do what I'm going to ask you to do now. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this stand and say by coming, I do open my heart to Christ as Lord and Master and Savior. I want him to forgive my past sins. I want to receive him into my heart now. I want to follow him and serve him. I'd like to be a David where I am. You may be an older man. You may be a young man, a young woman, father, mother, young person. You get up and come. The Bible says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. For many of you, you may never be this close to the kingdom of God again. This is your moment. There's a passage in the in First Samuel seventeen forty seven that says this, and this is David, young David, just a, a lad, a teenager, and he's speaking. He said, "And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear." For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, of course, this is David speaking as he was facing the great giant Goliath. There's a battle going on between the Philistines on one side and the Israelites on the other. And this is symbolic of the battle that every young person must face here tonight, young and old. Because the Bible says in Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Inside of us, we have two natures, a fleshly nature, a carnal nature, and a spiritual nature. And they're constantly at war inside of the believers especially. Now here is a battle going on. Here's the Valley of Elah. And on one side of the Israelites, the other side of the Philistines, and this great giant of a man is challenging the Israelites to a duel. You see, the Philistines picked out their strongest man. The Israelites were to pick out their strongest man, and whoever won, won the battle, won the war. Now, that would just mean one person for each side. Now, the Bible tells us how big Goliath was. He was nine feet, nine inches. He was clothed in heavy armor. He had a spear heavier than a weaver's beam, almost as big as a tree. He defied the armies of Israel for 40 days. Nobody had the courage to go out and fight Goliath. The men of Israel were afraid. They were trembling as they stood on their side of the valley. Now there's a small young man. When I say young man, he was probably 15 or 16 years of age. And he had been watching his father's sheep while his brothers were out with the armies. And so his father said to him one day, David, I want you to go visit your brothers and see how they're doing in the battle. And take these 10 loaves and 10 cheeses to them. And so David approaches the camp where they're camped. And he hears the challenge of Goliath, the giant, who says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And David begins to ask questions. What in the world's going on? He said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, you know, the world today faces some giants. We face giants of social injustice. We face the giants of wars that are being fought at this moment. We face the giants of AIDS that is about to wipe out one middle African country and is sweeping many parts of the world and no cure in sight. We face the giants of energy crisis, an ozone crisis, the greenhouse crisis, poverty, starvation in Africa that we read about. 
All of these things are giants that the world faces right now. And we need God's help. We cannot solve these problems ourselves. And then there are individual giants that you face in your life. Young people today face giants. They have to battle with these giants every day. One of them is a desire for acceptance or peer pressure. The identity crisis, status to be recognized. And all young people have this problem, especially in school. The peer pressure on you is so great to take that smoke or to take that crack. Just one dose of crack and you're hooked for life. And there seems to be no cure to it. It's sweeping the country. And the drug problem is just like an invasion of an enemy army, except it's far worse. And we're at war, whether we like it or not, with drugs. And then young people have a longing for security. That's another giant that you face. While young people may be rebelling, they actually are wanting authority in their lives. You see, we were built for authority. Some philosophy will ultimately master you. Some ideology is going to direct your life. You're going to give yourself to someone or something to believe in. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He said again in John 13, 13, you call me master and Lord for so I am. In Christ, there can be the authority that you've been searching for. Whether you like it or not, you really want authority. And that's one of the reasons many young people rebel. I can understand why they rebel against some of the parents that I see interviewed on television. Because they're not worthy to be parents. But there's also among young people a hunger to be loved. An American juvenile judge said some time ago, I've never had a wayward girl before me who was loved by her father. Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister and had almost as much to do with Hitler's rise to power as anyone else. He was a PhD from Heidelberg University, a very intellectual man, as were many of the Nazis. And yet he had polio and he limped as he walked and young people in the school would make fun of him. They called him the limping louse and people didn't love him. They weren't attracted to him until one day this little man from Austria came along and put his arm around him and loved him and gave him a place and made him feel accepted and wanted. And he gave his life to Nazism. God does that for you. He comes and puts his arms around you and loves you. And he says, you can find a place with me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I will love him, the scripture says. And he proved his love by giving his son to die for us on the cross. The apostle John said, behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us. And the thing that I said yesterday, I'd like to repeat tonight. If you get nothing out of these meetings, out of this mission, I hope that you will remember that God loves you. He's interested in you. He has every hair of your head numbered. You are an individual before God whom he loves. And if you had been the only person in the whole world, his son would have died on the cross for you. Yes, he can be the authority. He can be the love. And then another giant that young people face is the problem of sex. A 24-year-old woman, a nice girl, a quiet social work student who wanted little more from life than to fall in love and someday have a family of her own. When she got involved with an older man in what she says was her first sexual relationship, the prospect of AIDS never even occurred to her. The relationship has been over now for two years, but she has been diagnosed as having AIDS-related complex. In the beginning, she says, I thought a lot about suicide. I thought, here I am. I just finished college. I'm ready to begin my life, and it's already all over. You see, sex is not a sin. Certain types of lust are a sin. There are certain types of lust that are not sin, because lust means desire. Desire to do the best you can is not sin, but when you desire something that is wrong, 
You see, man has taken something good and holy and corrupted it, and God's great gift has been perverted. And why does God say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Why does he say that? Does he not want us to have a good time? He does it to protect marriage. He does it to protect your body. He does it to protect you psychologically. Because you see, psychologically, you have that sense of guilt and emotional disturbances and insecurity, and you feel unloved. How can you face the giant of sex? Young people today, young men, they reach their peak at about 18 to 22 in their sexual desire, women a little bit later, but all have it. It's a gift from God, but we've perverted it and we've misused it. And now we're beginning to pay for it in these terrible diseases and other things that are sweeping many parts of the world. How can you face this giant, this urge, this passion that you have and still be true to God and still be clean and pure? There's no way, not in the modern day, except you have Christ in your heart who will give you supernatural power to resist and to say no and to be pure and to practice chastity. The marks of a Christian are self-control and self-discipline. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, keep yourself pure. He said, flee youthful lust. He also said concerning himself, he said, I keep my own body under obedience and discipline and bring it into subjection. You can do that too with Christ's help. If he's your master and your Lord, you can control this powerful energy that you have and that God has given for a purpose. We wouldn't have the propagation of the race. Somebody asked me, why did God give us sex? I said, I wouldn't be here were it not for sex, and neither would you. It's a gift from God, for, but inside of marriage, inside certain parameters, and we're to keep those parameters. And there's no joy, and there's no thrill, and there's no love, and there's no excitement, and there's no passion comparable to sex within marriage. Sex within marriage between two believers is a marvelous thing. Yes, there are spiritual forces of evil in the world. There are spiritual forces of good in the world. And on one side is God. On the other side is the tempter, the devil, Satan. And there's a great battle going on in our world, and that battle is going on inside you too. And there's only one way to withstand the giants and to conquer the foe. Now notice that David was out experienced. He'd never been in a battle. He was outnumbered because the giant Goliath had an armor bearer. He was out armed. David had nothing but his slingshot. He was outweighed. And David said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God and the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David had nothing but his faith in God. And you and I must go out with our faith in God, daily Bible reading and prayer, to meet the enemy that we must meet every day and every hour of every day. There's no let up. Satan never lets up. David went out clothed in the armor of God, depending on God and trusting in God. And David gets his sling and he stoops and he chooses in the, in the little brook that was between the two armies, he chooses five round stones. Somebody says, why did he choose five? He only needed one. Well, there's a passage in 2 Samuel 21, 22 that says he had, that Goliath had four sons. And whether he was his sons or his brothers, David expected that as soon as he got through with Goliath, he'd have four of his family to deal with. And they might be giants too. And he was going to get ready for all of them. Now, five stones that you as young people ought to take with you. You take a personal faith in Christ. Notice personal. David had a personal relationship with God. And then a daily devotional life. And then a disciplined life. 
and a dedication to the service of other people and preparedness. David had those, you can have those five stones in your little bag. A personal faith in Christ, a daily devotional life, a disciplined life, a dedication to the service of other people, and your preparedness. And you're ready to do battle with the enemy every day. Lincoln once said, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. You get prepared and someday your chance will come. And so the giant Goliath laughs and sneers and taunts David. And David said to him, This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand. And so David took his sling and he threw the stone and it went right into the forehead of Goliath. And to the amazement of everyone, both Philistines and Israelites, he fell down dead. David didn't have a sword. So he reached over and he took Goliath's great big sword and he severed his head and took that head in his hand and carried it back to the armies of Israel. And the armies of Israel began to pursue the Philistines as the Philistines fled and they won the battle that day because one young boy had faith enough to believe in God that God could do anything. And this young man had prepared in his youth. He'd made his decision as a boy to serve God at any cost. He made his decision to meditate on God night and day. He made his decision to live for God, to live a life of purity before God in the strength of God. He knew he didn't have the strength, but with yielding to God, God would give him the strength. And in the same way, you cannot face the giants alone. You need Christ and you can receive Christ into your heart tonight or you can rededicate your life to him tonight. I'm going to ask you to do that. We saw yesterday over 1,500 do what I'm going to ask you to do now. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this stand and say by coming, I do open my heart to Christ as Lord and Master and Savior. I want him to forgive my past sins. I want to receive him into my heart now. I want to follow him and serve him. I'd like to be a David where I am. You may be an older man, you may be a young man, a young woman, father, mother, young person, you get up and come. The Bible says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. For many of you, you From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want to talk a little bit to people that are watching by television and say a word about New York City. And it's a joy and a privilege for me and my colleagues to be back here in New York. And for some time I've seen signs that says, I love New York. And that's true of me. I developed a love of New York years ago. I told Mayor Dinkins week before last when I visited him, that he and the leaders of this city would always be in my prayers, that God would be with them and help them to solve the problems of this city. But they can't solve it without your help and they can't solve it without God's help. We're going to have to turn to God. We've turned everywhere else and we've failed. Now let's turn to God. Some churches and synagogues, as they ponder the agonizing needs of the people, have abandoned the proclamation of our relationship with God or with Christ. And we've adopted instead a political and social agenda, which if out of balance can leave both souls and pews empty. Everybody I talk to, it seems, agrees that New York is the loneliest place in the world. And people get increasingly irritable and pushy in their effort to guard their own turf. There's little space for others, let alone God. To be without God in New York, is to be terribly lonely. And this leads to a feeling that life is futile. A few weeks ago, the New York Times stated that the bestseller of its class was Derek Humphrey's Final Exit, a manual on how to commit suicide. Is that the way to terminate your life? Suicide? Many people want to turn their backs on New York. They see New York City's problems as incurable. I think we ought to stay in New York and let's do something about it to change New York. And I believe we can do it. 
And if New York were changed, it would touch London and Paris and all the other great cities of the world. I don't see that way, that way with, about New York. God loves New York, and he has not given up on this city because he does not give up on people. As big and grand as New York buildings are, they are not New York. As wide and famous as New York City avenues are, they are not New York. As great as the plays and musicals and art and concerts are, they are not New York. New Yorkers are what make up New York. New York is a place where people live, and it's the people that God is interested in. And I'm going to speak on what I believe is the answer to the problems of your problems and the problems of New York. There is a better way. I'm going to make my message today short, and I know that'll please you. I never did like to hear long sermons, and I still like to hear short ones. I heard about a man one time that was introduced to speak for 20 minutes, and he spoke for an hour and 10 minutes, and he was still speaking. And the man that introduced him threw a gavel and it missed him and hit a woman on the front row. And she said, hit me again, I can still hear him. And I don't want that to happen to me today. I want you to turn with me to the 16th verse of the third chapter of John. John, the third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many of us can say it together? Let's try all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that is the gospel in a nutshell. That's a miniature Bible. Everything you need to know about redemption and salvation is in that one verse of Scripture. Twenty-five wonderful words that my mother taught me when she was giving me a bath on a Saturday night on a farm in North Carolina. She said, I want you to learn this passage from the Bible. And she taught me that passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many people ask me, well, if God loves the world, why does he allow so much suffering in the world? War, disease, poverty, hate, loneliness, boredom, emptiness, psychological problems, unemployment, violence, tension, all of these things. Why doesn't God just come and stop it all? That's the question many people are asking. Some people here in New York are saying, I can't take it anymore, and they're committing suicide. The pressures of life are too great. They can't take it. Why? If there is a God, why doesn't he end it? Some people say, why has God abandoned us? But God has not abandoned us. We've abandoned him. Many of you young people here have heard the song on last year's Edge of the Century album by Styx. However, did you ever listen to the words, the lyrics? Here are the lyrics. Listen. Every night I say a prayer in the hopes that there's a heaven. But every day I'm more confused as the saints turn into sinners. All the heroes and legends I knew as a child have fallen as idols of clay. And I feel this empty place inside so afraid that I've lost my faith. Show me the way. Show me the way. Bring me tonight to the mountain and take my confusion away and show me the way. And if I see a light, should I believe? Tell me how I will know. Show me the way. Show me the way. Take me tonight to the river and wash my illusions away. Show me the way. Show me the way. Give me the strength and the courage to believe that I'll get there someday and please show me the way. And every night I say a prayer in the hopes that there's a heaven. And this passage says, for God, for God. Do you believe in God? Yes. I can't prove God. I can't take you to a scientific laboratory and prove to you that there is a God. But the Bible teaches us about him. He is the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All those stars at night that you see, 
if you can see them in New York, God created them and started them. He is also a spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He doesn't have a body like you and I. He could only be one place at one time if he had a body like yours. But God is a spirit. He can be everywhere at the same time. He can be in Russia. He can be in China. He can be in America. He can be in Africa. He can be in Latin America. He can be everywhere at the same time. God is also unchanging. I am the Lord God. I change not, says the Bible. In him is no variables, neither shadow of turning, says James. The Bible says that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Think of it. He's appointed a day, a moment, in which he's going to judge the world, and you'll be there. God, but God also is a God of love. My mother loved me, but she didn't love me near as much as God loves me. And that seems impossible to believe. My wife loves me. I love her. I have five children. I love them. I have 19 grandchildren. I love them, and I hope they love me. I have three great-grandchildren. I think they love me, and I love them, and I know that they all love the Lord. But nothing is to be compared to the love of God. They had to invent a whole new word in the Greek language to tell us something about the love of God. God is a God of love. He loves you. And if there's one thing I want you to take from this great park when you leave here today, it's this. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And God is interested in you. And he has the hairs of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He knows all about you and he loves you. No matter how many sins you've committed or whatever you've done, you may have gone as low as Nicky Cruz described a moment ago his life was, but God loves you. And if God could change Nicky Cruz and change Johnny Cash, God can change you if you will let him. And he can do it today, beginning right now. Yes, God is a God of judgment. He'll bring every work into judgment. And he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world. But God is also the God of love. Nothing compared to the love of God. The Bible says God is love. Yea, I have loved thee with a love that's everlasting, says Jeremiah. And for this reason, God created man. Have you ever wondered why you're here? Why God created the human race? And what's the purpose of the human race? God created you because he's a God of love. And he wanted some other creatures in the universe that could choose to love him in return. And so he created man, Adam and Eve. He put them in a perfect paradise. And we believe that that was located in the country that's now called Iraq, at the head of the Persian Gulf. Much of the Bible was written in Iraq, Nineveh, Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees where Abraham came from. And Abraham is the father of the Jews and the Christians and the Islamic people. Abraham is the one we all look to as the beginning. He came from Iraq. And that's the reason there was so much interest in Iraq during the Gulf War. That's why the, so many books were written from the Bible about the Gulf. And God created man and put him in that Garden of Eden, that perfect environment, that perfect paradise. And God gave man a choice. And God said, I, can, I want you to have all the fruit of the garden except one tree. You can't eat of that one tree. God was testing man. And God said, if you eat of that tree, you are going to break my law, you're going to suffer, and you're going to die. And man broke God's law. God gave him a free will to choose, and man chose to rebel against God. I heard a TV talk show the other day. You can listen to nearly all of them, and they're discussing what's wrong with human nature. Why do people do the things they do? Why do people commit the crimes they do? Why do people tell the lies they tell? Why is there so much jealousy? Why are there so many problems in the world? It's because man has a disease, and the disease is called sin. What's the basic cause of war and crime and deceit and fraud? Why do we have to have hospitals and jails with bars and windows and police forces and military forces? Our social problems are basically moral and spiritual problems, and the moral problems require a religious solution. All these problems indicate that something is wrong with human nature. 
People have been looking to technology or political force to save us. But God says, your problem is in your hearts. The first sin ever committed was committed in a paradise. It's a heart problem. Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and blasphemy. The Bible says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. The Bible says sin is a breaking of the law. What law? The law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience? Then you've committed a sin. Have you ever broken one of the Ten Commandments? Then you're a sinner. Have you ever failed to keep the requirements of the Sermon on the Mount? Then you're a sinner. We've come short of what God requires. And we're sinners before God. And sin comes between you and God and comes between you in peace, between you in happiness, between you in joy, and between you and the assurance that if you died, you're going to heaven. Solomon, the great king of Israel, once said, there is no man that sinneth not. We are alienated from God. Let's remember that. We are separated from God, but in spite of that, he still loves us. Yes, there is a hell. There's a hell in this life, but there's also a hell in the life to come if we keep, if we are separated from God. The Bible teaches that death has three dimensions. There's natural death. When you die, you're going to be buried or you're going to be cremated or however you're, they're going to handle you. We disappear from this earth. But there's also spiritual death. Living inside of you as your soul or your spirit. That's the part of you that lives forever. That's the part of you that can have fellowship with God. And you have broken God's law and as a result of it, you're spiritually dead. You're dead toward God. And that death will continue throughout eternity after you're dead. And you're not going to be out there with thousands of people having a good time, as many people describe hell. You're going to be all alone. You're going to be, there'll be a terrible loneliness to it all. And that's what hell is. And we can have hell in this life and hell in the life to come. And that's called eternal death. Words in the New Testament used by Christ to describe the penalty of sin is lost, perish, condemned, punishment, hell. God saw all this confusion and saw us stumbling in darkness. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were either bored on the one hand or we were physically dying on the other. So God decided to do something about it because of his love. God couldn't just forgive us or he would break his own word. He wouldn't be God. He had said that if you sin, you're going to die. If you sin, you're going to suffer. We had to suffer. We had to die so God's word could be kept. One day I was walking with one of my sons along a road in North Carolina. We stepped on an anthill and we looked down and we saw those ants dying and suffering and saw their little house destroyed and my son said to me, Dad, wouldn't it be great if we could uh, help those ants rebuild our house, take them to their hospitals? I said, yes, but we're too big and they're too little. Then I thought, what a wonderful illustration. God looked down from heaven and saw us with all of our darkness, with all of our stumbling and all of our problems and fightings and bickerings and difficulties and wars. But God was too big. We were too small. We looked like little ants crawling on this planet. What could God do? God decided to do something about it. God became a man. God became a man. And that man was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born of the Virgin Mary. And he came for one purpose. He came to save you and to save me and to save the world. And he came to die. He's the only man that was ever born just for the purpose of dying. He took our sins on the cross. They took him outside of Jerusalem and nailed him. The Romans did, not the Jews. The Romans took him outside the walls of Jerusalem and nailed him on a cross. And he shed his blood. And in that terrible moment when he was hanging there, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible moment, he made seven agonizing expressions. And in those expressions, he was telling us that he had taken our sins. 
He was made to be sin for us. Think of it, he was made to be sin. He became guilty of your adultery. He became guilty of all the sex sins that you've committed. He became guilty of all the envy and the jealousy and the fighting and the killing and the murders that you read about in the newspapers almost every day. He hath made him to be sin for us. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think of it. He took our sins. Now what do we have to do? We have to repent of our sins. All through the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets said, repent. The first sermon Jesus ever preached was repent. And all through the New Testament, they wrote repent, 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 repent. What does the word repentance mean? It means that you confess to God, I have sinned against you, Lord. I'll admit it. It means that you turn from your sins. You're willing to let God have his way in your life and you're ready to follow him and serve him from now on. That's repentance. A few days ago, in our daily bread entitled, Take Me to the Cross, Cliff Barrows gave me this wonderful little story. A policeman, an officer, was patrolling on night duty in a town in northern Great Britain when he heard a quivering sob. He saw a little boy in the shadows sitting on a doorstep, tears rolling down his cheeks. The child said, I'm lost. Please take me home. The policeman began naming street after street, trying to help the boy remember where he lived. He named the shops and the hotels in the area, but all without success. Then he remembered. In the center of the town was a church with a large white cross towering high above the surrounding city. He pointed to it and said, do you live anywhere near that? The boy's face immediately brightened. Yes, sir. Take me to the cross. I can find my way home from there. And if you come to the cross today, there is a way if you come by the way of the cross. If you're lost, the only way home is to come to the cross. The cross of Christ directs lost people to their eternal home. But Jesus didn't stay on a cross. He rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. And I'm not speaking to you about a dead Christ. I'm speaking to you about a living Christ. And this living Christ is going to, can come into your heart today by the Holy Spirit and make you a new person, give you a new outlook on life. Take away that loneliness. Take away all those sins that you've committed and wipe them away so that when God sees you, he never sees your sins. You are justified in his sight as though you'd never sinned. And then the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back again someday. I was in Jerusalem, and I was talking one day to the chief rabbi. And I asked him, I said, sir, do you believe that Messiah is coming back? He said, oh, yes. I said, I do too. But I said, I believe when he comes, you're going to notice that he's Jesus Christ. He laughed for a moment over his cup of coffee, and he said, he didn't laugh, he just smiled. He said, of course, that's our difference. We're both looking for Messiah, but we believe that it's going to be Jesus Christ. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory with power and great glory. He's coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom. Yes, communism did not win. No ism is going to win. Only Christ is going to win. And someday, Someday he's going to rule the world. But tonight he wants to rule your heart. He wants to come into your home, into your family, into your neighborhood. He wants to come into our country. And he wants to be king of kings and lord of lords. Now what does God require of you? I've already told you about one thing, repentance. During this past week we've been celebrating the holiest days of the Jewish year. Yom Kippur, which is celebrated on Wednesday, is intensely personal. The Jewish holidays ask three questions. What have, we done our li what have we done with our life during the past year? Where are we now in our life? What do we plan to do with our life in the coming year? And one reason that Yom Kippur exercises such an enormous grip upon the Jewish people is because the holiday theme is so personal and contemporary. There's not a person among the people that can say, my life is complete and spiritually filled. 
we all fall short. And we have to say with everyone else, I too am a sinner. I'm separated from God. I'm lost. I need to find my way home. It's not an option. It's a command. In Acts 17, the apostle in his sermon says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Think of it. God commands it. It's a command for you to repent. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? If you haven't repented of your sins, you'll never see the inside of the kingdom of heaven. And then you come by faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll never be able to work your way to heaven. You have to come by faith in Christ. And you come by the grace of God. Grace means it's something you don't deserve. You can't work for. You come by faith in Him. That's how I came, by simple childlike faith. You say, Billy, those are such simple things. that Jesus spoke with such simplicity about spiritual things that the children heard Him gladly. And we're, we're to make it simple. It's a profound truth, but it's to be proclaimed in simplicity. And all of you today that are willing to say, I will repent of my sins, I receive Christ as Savior, I want to follow Him and serve Him, or I want to rededicate myself. You might want to renew your vows that you took at confirmation or at baptism or whenever it was. And you want to say, Lord, I want to come back to you. I've wandered away from you and I've gotten confused and lost. And I want Christ to be first in my life. I want him to forgive my sins. I want to come to the cross and I want to follow him from now on. Hold up your hand. Yes, there are many people with hands up. And there are so many people standing. I can't ask you to stand because you wouldn't stand out. And there are four things from now on that are very important. First, read the Bible every day. The Bible is food for your soul. Secondly, pray. Perhaps you cannot pray like a clergyman, but you can say, Lord, help me. I'm in need of help. He'll come and help you. He'll answer your prayer. Pray it in Christ's name. Say, Lord Jesus, I, I need you. And then the third thing, witness for Christ. You ought to tell some people when you go home tonight or tell people tomorrow, you know, at that great lawn meeting, I made a commitment to Christ and I mean to keep it with God's help. That'll help you to win other people to Christ. And then... The fourth thing is get into the church. Into a church where Christ is proclaimed and follow him and serve him as best you can. Because you see, when you leave here, you won't leave alone. The Spirit of God goes with you. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Pray it out loud. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess Him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow Him and serve Him in the fellowship of His church. In Christ's name, amen. You can make that same commitment, write 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 that same commitment.